ladies and gentlemen, please make welcome your host for this evening, Hamish McLaughlin. Good evening, everybody, and uh, welcome to Earthwatch and the Oceana Gala Dinner. I hope you enjoy your evening. My name is Hamish McLaughlin, and we talked earlier about uh, Dr. Kathy Townsend, who is a Canadian who's lived in Australia for 20 years, who's been at the uh, University of Queensland for 15, has spent half a decade just investigating, researching, talking to, uh, often just spending hours underwater with manta rays. And the reality is there's probably not too many people in Australia that can talk to us and educate us more on what is required to protect our oceans, which we are raising money for tonight, and how serious our plight is. So without any further ado, our keynote speaker tonight is Dr. Cathy Townsend. Please make her feel welcome. I'm talking today about the stuff that I'm doing with the manta rays. And so Project Manta is a multidisciplinary study looking at the biology and ecology of an iconic species. Um, and so just a little bit of background about manta rays. Some of you may or may not know this. They are the largest known ray to ma that we know. They, there's two different species, and one species, which is known as manta birostris, that can get up to seven meters across. That's like a small plane. Um, whereas the other one that we have here in Australia, Manta alfredi, gets up to five meters, which is still pretty impressive when you're sitting in underneath them. So they're the really big animal. The fantastic thing about this, and which my parents are very happy about, is that they're completely harmless. Um, they don't have any teeth. They have like these sort of little um, filing, nail file type things in their bottom mouth, and they don't have a barb. So I have, you know, I'm not going to be doing a Steve Irwin, which is quite nice. My mom's quite happy about that. Um, they're found in warm tropical waters um, around the world, um, and we think that they're a pretty long-lived species. We're estimating that between um, 50 to 80 years that these animals live for. They, um, are, they spend 13 months being pregnant, so their gestation period is quite long, um, and they have a, one pup every two years. So in actual fact, even though this is a ray, they're much more closely related to things like whales in that any pressures that are placed on these animals has a really big impact. So why manta rays? Well, I've always loved sharks and rays. That's one of those things that I've always been fascinated with. And as you can see by the images here, they're amazingly graceful creatures. Um, and they're also extremely interactive, which is very unusual for a manta ray. They'll actually come right up, or sorry, unusual for a, a shark and ray. They'll actually come right up and look at you. And, and I've had manta rays come past my, uh, over my head, draping their, um, their tail across my shoulder. So it's a pretty spectacular event. Um, so I was invited to do a talk for a dive shop back in 2001 on the island that I live on. And I thought, oh, well, I'll do a bit of a literature review, come up with a really nice little talk to present to them. To my horror, there was five publications of manta rays in Australia. Three of them were taxonomy, and the other two were ones where they just happened to see manta rays in another bigger project that they happened to be doing. So m about three years later, um, and um, lots of grit and in determination, I raised the funds and Project Manta was born. So why are manta rays significant? Well, they're listed as vulnerable on, to extinction on the IUCN um, red list, so they are actually an endangered species. Um, they are the basis of an ecotourism industry worth billions. I don't know if you can see that image very well that's up there, um, but that's actually an image from Hawaii where they've got, they put lights uh, at nighttime under the water and the, all the plankton congregates around the lights and the manta rays come in and feed on it. And it is literally a billion dollar industry just in this one, in, in this one area, as well as other places in the world. People will spend a lot of money to be able to dive with a manta ray. They are surprisingly, you may be surprised about this, they're not currently protected in any Australian state or federal waters. And internationally, there's actually only four places in the world that they're actually protected. So at the moment, the way it stands, these animals could be fished without any big problem, without any um, inhibition. And that brings leaves us to our threats. 
And what's happened in recent years is that there has now become a targeted fisheries for these animals. In the past, manta rays would be caught accidentally uh, as bycatch as during other fishing industries. But now what's ended up happening is that manta rays have a great value, particularly in the Chinese market. They use it for medicinal purposes. And what they're collecting is the gill rakers. Um, and the gill rakers apparently, be, they, they're used because apparently they filter the blood. Um, and so one animal can be worth 500 plus American dollars. Um, and most of that is just about the gill filaments and the rest of it gets thrown away um, or not used very much at all. Of course, other impacts are things like uncontrolled tourism and climate change is another big problem because they feed on microscopic plankton and plankton is one of those things that's being earmarked as being one of the really big, um, being impacted really heavily by changes caused by climate change. So what are some of the aims of Project Manta? Well, we want to investigate some key biological parameters because one of the things I didn't mention is that we don't know a lot about manta rays. That little bit of, that I sort of gave you on the first slide is pretty much all we know. We know very little about these animals. So we have no idea how many there are. We don't know how often they reproduce um, and also what the growth rates are for the animals here around Australia. We want to determine the pattern and timing and magnitude of movement patterns. So how far away are they going and where are they, um, is there a timing associated with, involved with that? and then also explore explanations for these movement patterns. And the reason that we're doing this is, of course, one of the places where there's a concerted fishing effort is to, it's in our nearest neighbors to the north. Um, and if, if the manta rays here in Australia are moving across these international boundaries, they may potentially be moving into a danger area. And so we need to understand their movement patterns so that we can put management things in place. So, so that brings us to where does Project Manta take place? Project Manta takes place on Lady Elliot Island, which is the very first reef on the southern tip of the Great Barrier Reef. So hence, there's lots of shipwrecks around Lady Elliot Island <laughs> because they end up running into the side. Um, so it's, we also have lots of the volunteers or people, just so you guys, I don't know if everybody's aware of this, but people that come on these sorts of trips are just people from the general public who want to do something meaningful on their holiday. Um, and the people who come along on these trips, we have them do three different types of activities. They'll do a diving-based activity, a boat-based activity, and then we have them doing land-based stuff. And so I'm just going to show you some photos of some of the stuff that we do. So this is the diving portion of Project Manta. Manta rays, quite considerately for um, researchers, they have a distinctive marks that you find on their bellies. And those spots and dots are unique to each individual. So we can use those dots to identify individuals. So we spend a lot of time with the, um, with the volunteers taking those underbelly photos. Now this expands beyond just what we're doing with the, research, with the teams on the expeditions. We also have recreational divers from all around Australia sending us photographs of these animals which we then compare with our database. And our database is currently up to over 570 individuals which is quite impressive. Um, lots of fun. So the next step after they take their photographs, we come back to the lab, we download all the photographs and they have to go, we, we flip through and go through the, the database to see if we can identify that individual. Is that individual one we know already or is it a new one? And if it's a new one, we have to create a new data sheet and everything that goes along with that and add it to the database. So that's the stuff that we do with diving. The next thing we, um, Brother International very kindly bought us a vessel to be able to do our work up on Lady Elliot Island. And with that vessel we do a lot of oceanography. So we're trying to understand some of the, some of the, thing, some of the features that are bringing the manta rays into and around Lady Elliot Island. And so we do things like that cage type thing that um, Fabrice has got there is called a CDTF which takes all sorts of different measurements of the physical. So things like temperature, salinity, um, conductivity. And so we can drop that down and get these really great profiles. And then the other thing that ends up happening is we actually have um, 
on island, the dive masters have completely bought in on this project. And while we're away, because we only go there three times a year, while we're away, they're daily filling in a logbook every time they've seen a manta ray and they record what the, the sea surface temperatures were like, what the conditions were. And so every time we come back to one of our expeditions, we get the, la the, the data book and we get the volunteers to help put some of this log, um, logbook entry stuff into the computers. We do plankton sampling and um, unfortunately it's not always as, as uh, pleasant as this particular photo here. The last trip that we did, um, we had quite high seas <laughs> as they were trying to do their plankton tail, the boat sort of doing this, this sort of thing which is quite challenging for the, um, for the volunteers. And then once we get the plankton, we bring it back, um, put it into formalin and preserve it and uh, as you can see, he survived so he's very happy about the experience. <laughs> And then finally, as I said, one of the big things that we're very curious about is the movement patterns of this animal. And um, I'm, I'm a bit of a gadget girl. I do like my gadgets. And uh, so I've been very fortunate to use the best of the technology that's available out there at the moment. Um, the animal that's in the top um, right hand corner there is an animal with the red tag. That's called an acoustic tag. And every two minutes or so, it releases a very high pitched ping that the animals can't hear and we can't hear. But it gets picked up by the listening station, which is, you can see we're oops, sitting there diving underneath it. And so every time the animal comes within 500 meters of that listening station, it picks up that tag. So it's like having a diver in the water 24-7, constantly listening out and seeing when that animal comes past. And then my very big gadgets, which I love the most, are the ones on the two animals on the bottom, and those are our satellite tags. And the satellite tags get put on the animals for about three months. It logs all this data, including where the animals are, depth profiles, temperature profiles, and then after three months, they release themselves and float to the surface and they dump up to a, uh, a satellite, which then comes back to my computer back uh, at work, which is quite nice. The other thing is once the volunteers actually come on one of these projects, I, I find it's really important to keep in touch with them. Um, and so one of the things that we've found that's been really successful is by having this Facebook page. And people can actually upload their photos on it. So we've had people send photos in and say, oh, we, I saw this animal at Byron Bay. Is it one that you recognize? And we can actually compare that with our database. And so we have sort of this constant dialogue with over, we've got over 1,000, I think we got about 1,500 people who like us. <laughs> <laughs> but the social, I mean, how cheap is that? I mean, using a free social networking software to be able to interact with the broader community. So what are some of our discoveries to date? Well, we've confirmed the geographical distribution. We, when, um, manta, when we started this project, we didn't actually realize there was two different species of manta. We thought there was only manta by rostris. Um, and so when we discovered a little bit later on that in actual fact there was two species and the one that we had here was the new one, um, we really had no idea what the distribution was. And so we confirmed geographical distribution from all the way down to Sydney, all the way up to the very top of the Torres Strait Islands. So we know that they hang out in that sort of broad region. But we've also identified some really important aggregation sites, particularly on these southern edges. Um, places like um, Lady Elliot Island, Lady Musgrave, um, Heron Island, and then a little bit further into New South Wales itself. Um, places like the Solitary Islands and also Byron Bay. We are the current world distance record holders for this species of manta. Um, prior to this study, the longest distance that this animal was thought to have gone was, uh, or had been recorded to have gone, was about 300 kilometers. Um, but we now have confirmed animals that have, have gone from Lady Elliot Island all the way down to the Solitary Islands, which is a, a distance of 550 kilometers. And all the rest of the researchers around the world are trying to break our record and they haven't done so yet. So we'll see how we go. And then we've also have some confirmed links. When I started this project, manta rays around North Strabrook Island would show up for six months of the year and then they'd disappear. And we didn't know where they went. Um, and so one of the things we have confirmed in, in recent times is that where they do go is they head to, to Lady Elliot Island. Um, and so there's some confirmed links between these regions. So some other discoveries to date. This is about our citizen scientist, um, David Biddle, um, who's been taking photographs of manta rays for over eight, 20 years. 
he actually sent us this photograph that you can see up there of Jeffrey. And he is our oldest manta ray to date. So he's over 18 years old because um, he took the photograph back in 1993 at North Stradbrook Island. And then we've recently seen him again at Lady Elliot Island on the trip last year. So this animal is over 18 years old. So they live a really long time. So where to next? Where's Project Manta going next? Well, we're going to put, deploy more satellite tags and we're also going to use satellite oceanography working with NASA to overlay the track of where the animals go with some of the oceanographic features to see if there's some sort of things that are causing the animals to move back and forth. We're looking at feeding ecology of the animals, population genetics, as well as large scale. I'm really hoping to, to my next stage after this is starting to do some large scale aerial surveys. Uh, one of my big supporters um, is from Lady Elliot Island and he runs the flight, uh, the airport that, that goes to Lady Elliot Island and he does flights from the Gold Coast all the way up to Lady Elliot. And we've talked about putting technology on the plane so that we can do these large broad scale surveys up and down the coast. And then one thing that I would really like to do eventually is to put critter cams on. And these are basically little tiny devices that you can attach to the animal which films, literally films what the animal is doing over a 24-hour period. Um, so as I said, I am a bit of a gadget girl. <laughs> so all those sorts of things are great. So of course a project like this is, doesn't happen on its own. I'm not the only person that's part of Project Manta. I have a large number of academics that are associated with us. There's three other academics associated with us. And then of course the powerhouses are the students who uh, contribute a lot to doing a lot of the grunt work that's involved in a project like this. Along with Richard who is the Earthwatch sponsor in the Red Arrow. And then my husband Kevin who get, keeps getting dragged along to a lot of these projects as well. So um, it is a really great great team. So I'd like to thank all of these people um, in order of awesomeness as you can see there. Um, and um, the one of the sponsors that we've had recently I've been working with really closely over the last year is Kaufman Productions. Kaufman Productions is a documentary team and um, they, we filmed a full hour length documentary called Project Manta over, la over the whole of last year. And they took me to all these amazing places. They took me to um, the Maldives and Yap and we went to all my various studying sites and then they themselves ended up going to Mexico and Sri Lanka as well. So this evening I um, introduce with absolute pleasure the fact that we are going to be able to do a two minute spot of the very beginning of this documentary. This documentary has not been released in Australia yet. It's been released in other places in the world and it's already won um, three different awards already. So it's a pretty amazing documentary. So I'd like to pass it on to Project Manta and Kaufman Productions. Thank you. We explore distant planets, but know so little about our own oceans. Here, even the largest creatures have been overlooked, like the giant manta ray. They're called manta from the Spanish for cloak and devilfish for their horns. And while some stay close to favorite sites, mysteriously others vanish for years. Now a group of scientists is on a mission to reveal the life of this intriguingly smart creature. Everything from now on will be new. We know so little that we're guaranteed we're going to be discovering new and exciting things pretty much every time we come out on a field trip. Exploring manta hotspots around the world, they find astonishing behavior. From these rarely filmed mating trains triggered by the full moon, to one of a kind feeding frenzies that only happen once a year. Anyone who's ever dove with them, they'll come up raving about the experience. I get extremely excited. That's why I love this project. Every time we get a manta ray coming in, it is such an exciting experience. 